Hello and welcome to today's episode of Courage Permission Slip. I'm your host, Kia, and today I'm bringing you another listener spotlight. And today I am talking with Matthew Griffith, who is a regular listener, but he is also an LA-based filmmaker and storyteller with over 15 years of experience as a director and cameraman on national campaigns, films, and documentaries. And he is also the director of the series, My First Dish, which is fabulous. Welcome to the show, Matthew Griffith. (laughs) Thank you, Kia. This is great. (laughs) Yeah, I'm so glad we get to do this. And I had to, um, so listeners, I have known, I'm going to say my nickname for you. I have known Griff for a very long time. And doing the math, Griff, I mean, it's been, um, God, since 2011, 2012 working yeah, at Sony. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. I've known Griff for 10 years and we have worked together in a variety of capacities at multiple organizations. And he's been, um, he's been such a great partner, but when I started this podcast, Griff, uh, you know, was a huge supporter and started listening right away. And I'm so thankful to you for sharing how some of the episodes have impacted you at different parts for different reasons. And so that's mm-hmm. really why I was excited to uh, invite you on so that you could share about how some of these episodes have impacted you. But first, I just would love for you, for you to share a little bit about you and, and where you are and what you're doing right now. Yeah. Um... Currently, I'm the, uh, well, first of all, thank you. I I think that we had talked about this podcast years ago in various formations, yes. but when it really hit the ground running, um, I was really hungry for inspiration mm-hmm. and for those those kind of courage, mm-hmm. like courage permission slips that it's yeah. it's was set up to do. I love hearing people's stories. And so I think that mm-hmm since that's the basis of this is where people's journey have taken them and when they were brave and when they were patient and those kind of things, Mm -hmm. I really responded to that. Yeah. Um, but a little bit about me, like, um, yeah, as Kia said, I am a filmmaker here in LA. I've been, um, working for a while, um, and have been kind of heading in the direction of a commercial, uh, director, um, and those kind of things. But, um, I'm also the father of four boys. So that keeps me really busy um, and just enjoying living in Southern California, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yes. And all the joys that come with living in SoCal, chiefly the weather, which I miss. It's a lot. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Uh, Yeah. And I'm so glad that you mentioned that because you were the first person that was going to help me. I mean, it wasn't courage permission slip at the time, but I was definitely starting to go into that realm. And I feel like, um, if I'm remembering correctly, and you may remember more than me, but I feel like the title that I had for the show initially was Shift Happens or something like that. Does that yeah. ring a bell? Yeah, yeah. It was very <laughs> kind of punny. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. But um, yeah, I gave myself my own permission slip and decided to really start it. Uh, so you have been a part of this journey for a long period of time. But with regard to what we're talking about today. And again, I know how much, uh, I mean, as a storyteller, I fully understand why the way that this this show is structured resonates with you. And I'm curious to hear from you, Griff, what were you dealing with prior to hearing the episode or the episodes? I know there were a couple that really stood out to you. What were you dealing with that these episodes helped you uh, to have a breakthrough of sorts? Yeah, um, well, I think the the main thing that I found in the episodes as really early on, but even through the whole like last year of of podcasts, is that no matter what field you're in, you have the second voice like mm. nagging you in your head, kind of telling you like it's not enough, you're not working hard enough, what you're doing right now is not cool enough. This is not what like for me it was filmmaking, right? So. I didn't go to film school to make commercials. I went to film school to make movies, but there's such a broad range of careers that you can have. And you kind of have to take those doors as they open. Mm -hmm. Um, And 
that does get take a certain amount of courage but then you still have that thing of like oh i'm not quentin tarantino like what mm. like what like how did that happen um it's giving yourself permission to uh i guess grow where you are and giving yourself permission to be to be happy and realize mm. that your career is not the defining aspect of your life yeah and i think that the reason i was able to realize that is because as someone like Micah Fields is a chef. And then um, some of the people who are in marketing, they're all dealing with the same yeah. things. They're all dealing with the same voices. They're all dealing with the same doubts. They're all dealing with the same, um, I guess, um, self-criticism mm -hmm. <laughs> as it were. Mm -hmm. um, and so what a lot of the times when things would perk up, it wasn't necessarily being like, oh, just be happy with where you're at. It's fine, right? it's not that really it's always looking for those opportunities to learn and grow and if you do that then when the opportunity knock comes mm -hmm. then you're prepared for it um, but if you just kind of wallow in self-pity or self-doubt i guess is a more appropriate thing um you're not going to be prepared you're not going to look at the the things that are exciting about where you are right now um i mean at the beginning of my career, I did like so many music videos, most of the time for artists that I just, I didn't, I didn't even like the song. It was just mm -hmm. an opportunity, you know? Yeah. Um, I think it's a little different when you get into the commercial, commercial or advertising world, because these companies, there's a lot of people that care about what you're doing and there is money behind it, which then that, there comes the art versus commerce mm -hmm. side of what I do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and uh, that kind of r respect and encouragement that I got in that field, that was really exciting. Um, but then you do that for a number of years and they're like, all right, what's, what's, what's next? Where's the next thing? But you kind of have to create it now. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, I love I love everything that you've shared and it makes, it resonates with me because, you know, you knew me in my first career of being a marketer. And yes, I mean, there, even though I'm not, you know, I'm not a designer, I'm not a videographer, I'm not, uh, you know, a web developer. So I'm not creative in that aspect, but certainly being the liaison between the agency and the client, uh, there was constantly that battle of walking that line of, as you perfectly said, art and commerce, because, you know, I work with people who live in beauty and creation and like the, the science of that, right? And knowing mm -hmm. what's aesthetic and what's pleasing to the eye. And then you have clients who are paying you a lot of money to do this work that are like, hey, can you just put a burst on it? Can you just, <laughs> yeah. can you just pop the headline or, you know, use a different font, right? And, mm -hmm. um, and so you learn a lot about yourself during that process and it guides you so that you can make better decisions or more informed decisions or decisions that are more true to your values and who you are mm -hmm. in the next, you know, part of your life. But I love what you started out with about that second voice and how everyone, no matter who they are, or what they're doing, everyone deals with that. And that's really the driving force for why I started and continue doing the show is because so many people are paralyzed by fear and self-doubt and all the all the things that come with stepping outside of your comfort zone and putting yourself out there mm -hmm. and i wanted to really normalize that because a lot of times people feel like it's just them yeah. i'm the only one who doesn't know what to do i'm the only one who's worried about what people are going to say i'm the only one that's afraid of disappointing people and that is so not true like everyone yeah. no matter how big they are, right? I call them blue check mark people, right? Like no matter if they're, <laughs> yeah. you know, in the public eye or if they're just, you know, regular everyday people doing a regular everyday person job, no matter who you are, everyone is dealing with some form of questioning. Right. Always tackling a relationship or trying to shift the relationship with that second voice that I love, I'm going to start using that because um, it is right. And sometimes it's 
the second voice and the third voice and the fourth voice, depending on yeah. what it is that you're you're dealing with. So thank you so much for sharing that and and putting that language to uh, that that fear and that voice that come up. Um, but I was curious for you because again, I, I remember you calling out a couple different episodes. So I would love to hear you uh, do a little chronicling of what. Uh, what specific episode or episodes really spoke to you and what insights were helpful for you? Yeah. Um, the, um, so I, I think even just starting off, one thing that I wanted to point out was the titles of, mm. of the episodes. Cause like more, more recently than the one that I emailed you about, uh, was the, like, whose life are you living? Yeah. Uh, it gets messy in the middle, mm -hmm. like all of those things. Um, those kind of episodes, what I, what I really related to is that when you're editing a project, you get all this big pile of footage, or even when you're producing a project. So like the first time that you ever try to pull a permit from a city and mm. cities don't want to give you a permit. They want your money and they want to like make your life as difficult as possible, <laughs> right? Or production insurance or any of those things. Every time I do that for the first time, I, I have avoidance, I procrastinate, it's so uncomfortable, but that idea of being able to be, okay, if I'm brave this time, guess what? I don't have to be next time because once you've done it the first time, it's not scary anymore. It, it goes, now it's a part of your thing. You don't even think about it. You know who to email, you know who to, 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 to whatever. The email that I sent you, the first email that I sent you was right after your break around the holidays. Mm -hmm. And I had gone back and listened to a few older episodes that I liked in the fall, but the, um, the new season started off, I think it was called I'm a hot mess <laughs> going back to the titles. Like I, yeah. at the time that was so what I was dealing with at the mm -hmm. time, again, it was the second voice. It was mm -hmm. being discouraged with mm -hmm. kind of career politics no matter where you are in your career, you deal with difficult people, difficult circumstances. You kind of want to spend time doing one project, but um, you are always kind of being paid to do this other thing. Um, and it's so funny, every filmmaker friend that I have, like 99% of my filmmaker friends want to be something and their career they're being paid to do something else. Mm. If they want to be an editor, they get to direct all the time. If they want to be a cinematographer, they get opportunities to edit. It's weird. It's weird how in, in our field, you kind of, because you do in order for, to not have to go get a job at, um, you know, not that there's anything wrong, but like have to go work at the gap or get a waiter job between gigs, you need to take the job or the opportunities that present themselves. But I'm a hot mess. I think that it, really kind of put into perspective what that second voice was doing to me mm -hmm. because it wasn't allowing me to enjoy where I was. Um, I work with a great crew. Mm -hmm. um, I love being on set. Mm -hmm. And the second voice was kind of ruining that. It wasn't mm -hmm. allowing me to like look at the creativity that I get to do every day and put that into perspective as I learn and grow, because there's still hopes and dreams. There's still aspirations to have my show, uh, my first dish be uh, monetized. It's, mm -hmm. um, there's lots of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but if you can't even enjoy your day to day, what did I get into this business for? Um, I think the reason that I'm kind of sensitive to it is because when I was growing up, uh, my dad for almost 40 years worked in the grocery business. Mm -hmm. um, so he would get up at three in the morning, go to work, work until like one, come home and sleep for an hour, help out around the house. Mm -hmm. And then like, we would always kind of make fun of him because at like 7.30, he was a pumpkin. He wanted to go to sleep. Mm. His, you know, And he did that for forever. Um, great example of taking care of your family. Great example of being a hard worker. But what he would talk to me about all the time, he'd be like, Matthew, you got to go to college and you need to do something that you love. And he'd probably told me that I feel like every day of high school is what it felt mm. like. He just like pounded that into mm -hmm. my head, mm -hmm. go to college. It's because in the eighties, I guess eighties and nineties, 
people still could kind of get away with not going to college, you mm -hmm. know, back mm -hmm. then, but it was changing so fast. Yeah. Um, but not just going, not just getting an education, but finding something that I woke up every morning and would be excited to do, mm -hmm. find fulfillment in, mm -hmm. and not just have it be a paycheck that you have to slog through for 40 right. years of right. your life. Right. And so, um, even though my career paths are kind of goals and desires have changed a lot since mm -hmm. I was a, a teenager, mm -hmm. I always had that in the back of my head. And then when I get to tell him like, Hey dad, I got to go do this thing. I have to get up at, I have to get up at three in the morning to go be on set on time. And he's like, Oh, it's that's easy. You don't have to go put milk <laughs> on the shelf, you know, like, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, right. Um, and so because I was in kind of a low point and being really hard on myself that, yeah. I, you know, I must not be working hard enough. I must not be talented enough. Mm -hmm. I must not be whatever it might be that, that second voice. Um, it really, so anyway, what that episode kind of led me to do was I wrote, I wrote a hype piece for myself. So instead of it, and I think it was partly because in the beginning of every episode where you kind of just tell a little bit about somebody, I was like, I should write that. Like, because if I took mm -hmm. myself out of my own head and mm -hmm. just looked at my career, just mm -hmm. on the surface, mm -hmm. what would I say about it? What would I say? Like, I went to school here. My first job in the industry was here. Um, and then I was, I did these projects and this is my specialty. And these are the things I got to do and kind of just take my ego out of it and just write down what I did. Mm -hmm. That really helped. Um, but as I was being really difficult, <laughs> my wife, mm -hmm. who uh, is always the one that keeps my feet on the ground because mm -hmm. my heads are in the clouds all the time mm -hmm. as a creative person. Um, she says, look, you keep doubting the decisions you made, but the decisions you made got you here. So you have to think about all the people that you wouldn't have met, mm -hmm. all the people that you'd like, if you didn't do that, then you wouldn't know this person or whatever. So then I made a list of all the people that if my career didn't go exactly the way that it went, I would have to let them vanish like Thanos, mm. right? Wow. They're no longer in my life. And that list made me cry. Oh, uh, wow. Every time I would think of somebody else that I'd kind of maybe forgot about, like if I didn't go to school at this pot, I wouldn't have met that teacher who's no longer with us. Um, uh, my dear, dear friends. And then I got to go and call some of those people and say, thank you for being on my list. Mm -hmm. Um, and I can tell you after I did those two things, my, that second voice has been in really quiet since Ooh. I did that really, really quiet. Wow. Um, and yeah, and it, and it really was very, kind of the, the, the spark that, that did that was, was the podcast. Yeah. Thank you yeah. for sharing that. And I remember you, I mean, I remember you telling me what your wife said and like, you know, saying that you were sounding ungrateful and all those things. Like, I remember that. And I remember you telling me about this list, but I didn't know like how deep you went into it. And that, I mean, that gives me the chills hearing that because I remember one of the things that you wrote to me was you had this question of, oh, you know, I would have been here if I had made this decision, I'd be further along in my career in this way if I had done this. And so the opposite of that, of appreciating the journey for what it has been and how those meetings and those relationships and those choices that you did make, how that brought you to this moment in time. And I think that is, you know, people poo-poo that like, oh, be grateful for where you are, right? But when you do it, in the way that you did it of just saying like, oh, if I didn't do, like these people wouldn't be in my life. And I just quickly running over that in my head, um, I am like, oh my gosh, like I, there's no, there's no way, there's no way that I would be where I was if I hadn't made those decisions or if certain things didn't happen. And this is, I mean, this is a really, really sensitive example, but um, when I was living in LA the first time, so this is before I worked at Sony, my dad had passed away. And that is what threw me on the trajectory of moving away to Portland, but staying in touch with friends that I used to work with at the marketing firm that I worked with and I, or worked at, 
And after that opportunity came up, so I moved up to Portland and met my husband, Casey, who you know and have Mm -hmm. worked with. And then we moved back to LA and that's when I came to Sony. And I mean, my life is forever changed. Like there are people, there are like second connections that I have that are now really strong, great friends now because of the people that I work with at Sony and my life, there is no way that I'd be doing what I'm doing right now if I hadn't made those choices. And sad to say, if my dad hadn't passed away, I would have just kept a really like safe, comfortable life in LA. And I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have changed anything. So not saying that, you know, I'm happy that my dad died. Cause I'm not like, it still is a very big point of grief for me. Yeah. And that opened the door for me to let go of the life that I had in order to let in this new one that I, that I lead. And that has changed so many times since making that those series of decisions. So, um, so I really, right. really appreciate you sharing that Griff. That's, uh, that's really beautiful. And I'm so glad that you did that. And it helped you to make peace with and find a new level of joy with what you're doing. Yeah. Mm. I, I do want to add though, to like, I think that what my wife said was presented in such a gentle way. Yeah. It, it wasn't like, why are you like, like mm-hmm. when somebody gets mad at you, like, why aren't you being grateful? Mm-hmm. Cause that's like mm-hmm. said, Whoa, be grateful where you are. And sometimes that can come off really insensitive. She knows how important my friends are. Yeah. I, I bond with people. I'm a forever friend, you know, <laughs> and she knew that that was the way for me to kind of put things into perspective yeah. because as hard as I am on myself about the career yeah. part of things, mm-hmm. or even the quality of my work, she knew that those things would would, would definitely put those into perspective. Um, I think that one of the big things that I used to be really critical of is when I first started, when I got out of film school, I didn't think of myself as someone who should go out and crew for people. I thought I'm a, I'm a cinema, I'm a filmmaker. I'm going to go out and make some films. Right. And so when I look back, I'm like, why was I so egotistical? Why Mm. did I not like just go and work with some really talented people and learn from them instead Mm -hmm. of thinking I had it all figured out. Mm -hmm. So that one's the big kind of the big regret. But when you Mm -hmm. look at, Hey, all of the, the way that I learn is by making mistakes. (laughs) So let's go get on Mm -hmm. set and we're going to make mistakes. And we're going to go after the shoot, we're going to go out and have some pancakes and we're going to talk about what we did wrong. And then next time we won't make those mistakes again, but those people that I get to go have pancakes with, that's why I got into filmmaking in the first place, Yeah, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Griff, to that point, so did you, are you able to answer that question of why you didn't, you know, make that, why you were like, why don't I want a crew? Like, were you able to answer that question or are you able to? Oh, answer no, that I can definitely answer it. That's why I'm mad at myself for it is because <laughs> I was too proud. Like, I really mm-hmm. thought like, I'm a creative person. I want to go out yeah. and make my own projects. I don't want to be like, running cable or, Mm. you know, uh, I don't know, pulling focus or whatever. But when I look back at the career that those people that are, I guess, humble enough to do that, what they get to do right out of film school is go be on camera teams for big projects. And I think that when I, I mean, it doesn't, it's not a guarantee, Mm -hmm. but I do like that humbleness of being able to go and help someone more talented than you, more knowledgeable than you, Mm -hmm been in the business longer than you Mm -hmm. help them achieve their goals. And then you get the reward of education Mm -hmm. and experience Mm -hmm. without the consequence of (laughs) some of the stuff that I've messed up in my (laughs) career. (laughs) But again, like, I mean, that's hindsight. That's hindsight. I just wasn't that kind of, you know, 20 something Mm -hmm. filmmaker. I wanted to go out and tell stories. I wanted to go out and create beautiful images Mm -hmm. and I mean, with the job that I have now, I, a lot, like almost at every project, I have to put a bottle of cleaning product on like a countertop and film it. And I've been doing that for a while. Creating that image is something that still makes me happy. It's still something that I try to make better than the next time and try to kind of think, oh, well, what if this was a bottle of wine? Like, how would I do that? You know, just, yeah. I mean, there's always a chance to kind of be like a, a hero gene, uh, dreams of sushi kind of like seeking perfection in what you do. Um, and I, I am where I am. Um, so let's, yeah. let's make, make it happen. Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. 
So Griff, you already talked about one action that you took as a result of what you heard in, in uh, those episodes. What, is there anything, or, you know, you made this decision to be very grateful and really, really like soaking up the richness of your network. Has that, because that was a couple months ago. Yeah. How, how is that impacting you today? Like, how are you carrying that through today? Or what shifts are you noticing today as a result of that activity? Well, yeah, I mean, that wasn't that long ago. Um, and when the second voice is quiet, yeah. the creative voice mm -hmm. can rise pretty dramatically. Mm -hmm. And since since that kind of email exchange and then we ended up like talking yeah. for a while and like mm -hmm. uh having a great conversation mm -hmm. um i what i see is because i'm not worried about that voice that that loud voice mm -hmm. kind of putting me down or, or whatever that self negative self-talk um i have co-written a screenplay with a friend of mine and i'm not a writer so what was really cool about that experience is my friend um wrote a script that was very dialogue heavy but not very screen direction heavy and he's like hey what do you think and just reading the dialogue the conversation that these two characters had really clicked for me mm -hmm. i liked it it was unique um it had a beginning middle and end meaning it felt like a scene that had a conclusion enough that it was worth putting time and effort into telling this story mm -hmm. um so what i did is i sat down and i wrote what i envisioned all the screen direction looking like what it what is what does the location look like what are they these actors doing between these sentences mm -hmm. that drive them from point a to point b and from line one to line five and i handed it back to him and uh he really really responded to it and it was really exciting because i'd never been brave enough to do that sitting it out at a paper and writing out anything if i get in front of you we can have a conversation forever, but if I'm trying to type an email, that is definitely not my strong suit. So putting that, that create, having that creative flow and be able to kind of develop this project with my friend, I wouldn't have been brave enough to do that if that little voice was like keeping the negativity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, on the forefront. A um, couple more things uh, is when with that gratitude, you can look at every project that presents itself in a way that uh, like, what have I never done before? What have I never tried before? What is something that I've always wanted to do? How can we use this project to, to fulfill that, that, um, need? Um, and, um, be, it's kind of almost like, um, something I've kind of noticed is that whenever my friend Nick and I used to do spec stuff we would just get together we'd rent some kind of photo studio and he would shoot photos and i would shoot video and we would kind of create something and a lot of times the video never even got edited but somehow that led to work and what we did on that shoot ended up leading to something else even though nobody ever saw it it was just now it's out in the universe mm -hmm. so with writing this short film with my friend rodrigo then I ended up getting a DP uh, or a cinematography role on another short film and that I'm going to shoot at the end of July. Um, and then um, being able to be open and kind of enthusiastic around other people. I've, I've developed a working relationship with uh, a, a really good uh, producer friend of mine that, that I didn't know more than like six months ago. And then that's grown. And it just kind of I think it's because the negative self-talk is out of the way yeah. and it creativity and this negative self-talk don't do very well together. Yes. So I think that's been the main, the main thing is that that perspective, that gratitude has opened doors. And then not only am I brave enough to do it, but I'm also kind of creatively open to do those yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. What a really, I'm just, I'm so even though I've been hearing, you know, drips and drabs about this over the last few months since you told me about this shift that you had had, it is so, like, I feel like I'm ready to jump out of my chair right now. It's just, it's so <laughs> wonderful to hear such incredible openings that you've had because I will say, you know, in the, in the videos that we've done together when we were working with the nonprofit, 
you said you don't call yourself a writer, but I remember you would write these great voiceovers to lead into the stories <laughs> that we were telling. And I, you know, and I would like have yeah. no notes. I'd have no <laughs> notes. So, you know, just- Well, that, that was always something that kind of maybe gave me a false <laughs> sense of security working with you because I would get this like, oh, this is great. Good job. Thank you. And then I'd work with other people and they'd be like, uh, can you change that? And I'd get all like offended. <laughs> like, aren't, aren't you supposed to love what, what I do? Didn't I? I mean, I think that's another part of, of something that I've learned from the podcast. You touched on it earlier where the when we're working with, I guess you could say executives or uh, the client side of things, when they're very business-minded and not creative and you have that clash of art versus mm -hmm. commerce, mm -hmm. I think that, I don't, I think it's because the people that are giving the notes, they don't realize how much heart and soul creatives put into everything they do. Absolutely. And it could be like an, an uh, you know, like I was saying just a second ago, it could be like a bottle of cleaning product sitting on a counter mm -hmm. and the thought and care that you took to light it, you know, mm -hmm. um, they, they're just, they just don't see it. And the more that you can kind of understand that, that these notes are because they're looking at either bottom line, they're looking at uh, marketing statistics, they're looking at these things. They don't, they don't, and they don't realize mm -hmm. how much mm -hmm. it matters to you. Mm -hmm. um, I think if we can keep that in perspective, it helps those notes when it's not always nice notes from right, Kia, right. you can, <laughs> you can kind of be a little braver yeah. or a, a little more, uh, less sensitive, I guess. Well, and you know, so the story, and I can't remember if Casey told you this, but, uh, you know, talking about the creator, I certainly, I talked about this with Micah, but, or in Micah's episode, but Casey, because you know, culinary is an art as well. And you mm -hmm. know the great care that Casey and Micah take when they are creating their dishes, when their thought is going into how to plate it up, right? Yeah, yeah. And I remember Casey saying, when someone, because, and I see on a regular basis, the heart and the thought and the care that he puts into creating a dish. And he said, I remember when we first started dating, he would say this, that when someone doesn't like what I've created, it's like someone telling you your baby is ugly. That's how he, <laughs> like he said, that's yeah. how, how personally yeah. we take it because we are putting all of our heart and soul into what we're putting on the plate, what we're serving mm -hmm. to you. So right. you talking yeah. about that, and I've worked with so many creatives and I know that, <laughs> I know that lesson very, very well. And uh, I have certainly learned how to give good, meaningful feedback uh, because of, right, because right. of <laughs> that understanding. Absolutely. Yeah. So Griff, um, I'm so thankful for all you shared. And I would love for you to help me land this plane by sharing what is it that you most want someone to know who is thinking about listening to uh, or sharing or taking guidance or considering guidance that they hear encourage permissions of what is it important for people to know? Um, I think like I, I, I've definitely thought about that a bit over the last few days. I think that when we talk about being courageous, when we talk about when you when you have these goals, you can see it so clearly. Um, and I'm going to use fitness as a really good example. When someone goes on a fitness journey, they see the goal in mind. They see the changes that they want to make, and and they you know um, it takes a long time to get out of shape. So then therefore it takes a long time to get back into shape. And on a journey like that, you need to have discipline, you need to have patience and you need to have hard work, right? You need all three of those things, but sometimes they're in different orders. It's almost like they're stacked on top of each other. And sometimes patience is at the top. Sometimes discipline is at the top. Like for me, um, it was always like, don't eat the chicken nuggets or the quesadilla that my kid left from lunch. You, you know, don't, don't do that. Right. So that's discipline. Mm -hmm. Um, or man, I'm really tired. I still need to get up and go for a run or go to the gym or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's discipline. 
but then when you've been doing that for six months and you don't look the way that you want to look or you're not to the goal that you want to get to that's where patience is now the 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 top of the list but guess is what the foundation is the hard work part so we have to keep going and these stories in this podcast these stories everyone is such a unique perspective um i so much of my professional career i've listened to podcasts from filmmakers right so it's mm. one story one goal one perspective and getting to listen to courage permission permission slip you get chefs and marketers and um fitness person there was one that i was listening mm -hmm. to the other day was like a, a yeah, yoga based kind of um person or a fitness based person i that's that's why this is so cool because you get mm -hmm. everybody's journey and you get their perspective and their bravery in different moments whether it was being patient or it was working hard or it was literally quitting your job and Mm -hmm. you know, going to, to start mm -hmm. your, your business. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Uh, I really appreciate that spin on it. And I appreciate the metaphor of the fitness journey because you're right. It takes a long time for us to build up these habits that we have of, mm -hmm. you know, giving more credence to the second voice and letting our doubt and our fears be more important than, the idea and the goal and the vision that we have for ourselves. And so it takes time to build, rebuild the muscle, reshape the muscle to be able to do that more easily. But just as you said, when you take a step, it's hard and scary the first time, but the next time you take the step, even if it's a little different, you still have done something similar before. So it makes it just a little bit easier. And the more you do it, the easier it gets. Uh, so I yeah, so yeah. appreciate your insights, Griff. Uh, thank you so much for being willing to share your stories and, and your struggles and your triumphs over, over the course of your career. Where can people learn more about you and get in contact with you? Uh, so I'm on Vimeo, uh, Vimeo uh, Matthew Griffith. Um, I'm on Instagram. I think it's M Griffith Cine. Uh, like cinema. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, those are the best places. Uh, I'm a lot better at kind of keeping my work up to date on Vimeo than I am on posting on Instagram, but that <laughs> that's a struggle. <laughs> <laughs> at least you at least you can own it. At least you can own yeah. it. Yeah. Well, I will share that information in the show notes. But again, uh, thank you so much for coming on and sharing more about you today. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thanks yeah. for having me on, Kia. Thank you. And thank you for tuning in to this episode of Courage Permission Slip. If you found us on YouTube, please make sure you like this episode and subscribe so you can be alerted when new episodes are available. And if you are listening on your favorite podcast platform, please make sure that you leave a review and rate so that others who are interested in this content can find it and enjoy it as well. That's it for today's episode. Until the next time, make sure that you are making your dreams more important and bigger than your fears. We'll see you on the next episode.